So we're in Lent. And part of what we're doing is these connection groups throughout the week that are focused on the same book that's leading our worship series, Brian McLaren's We Make the Road by Walking. I'm co-leading one of these groups with uh, Reverend Jim Ryan, who's a retired clergy person. He and his wife attend here. He's one of those clergy persons who, after years of ministry, now has a story for, I think, every life situation. That's what happens after a career in ministry. And so he was telling me as we were preparing for our first class that he had a story come to mind when he heard the title of Brian's book, We Make the Road by Walking. So here's his story. There's a new university under construction in the works, in the plans, and as happens when you're building a new university, there are multiple aspects happening at once. There are professors being recruited, there are students being recruited, there are blueprints that design the buildings and the landscape, and everything is coming together. The staff are being hired. So it takes a little time, and after a while, the university opens. And everybody comes to the campus, and the faculty and the staff and the students find themselves in a curious situation. The construction of this university failed to include one very common aspect that you would find at all universities, sidewalks. They didn't build any sidewalks. There are no sidewalks connecting one building to another or the sidewalks around the campus. There's no sidewalks to tell you where you're supposed to walk or, in some cases, more importantly, where you're not supposed to walk. But it wasn't an oversight. It was intentional. They decided not to build sidewalks to see where people would naturally walk. The paths that would be set by those who were going from one building to the next or walking around campus Where would they make the path by walking? And so they waited a couple years, and then after the paths were determined by those who walked it, the concrete was laid and the sidewalks were made. We make the road by walking. What a great story for that book title. We make the road by walking. In Jesus' time, as in most times throughout history, there are folks on opposing sides or people with opposing viewpoints. In Jesus' time, there were those who taught and believed that following the letter of the law down to the smallest detail, the most minute detail of the law, was important. Following the law down to this letter of the law, this detail meant that you were righteous, you were above reproach, And the Pharisees fit into this group. For the Pharisees, the path to right relationship with God was strict adherence to the law. And straying from that law was straying from God. Now, there was a group in opposition to this idea. Those who actually were in opposition to much of the laws. Folks who wanted to rebel or revolt against what was the common understandings, the traditional interpretations They sought an opposing viewpoint. And there were folks in each group that had wanted Jesus to fit in with them. Folks that wanted Jesus to follow the letter of the law and folks that wanted Jesus to rebel and revolt against it completely. And as Jesus often did, he didn't make anybody happy. He refused to fall into either conflicting camps. And instead, he offered a third way. Instead of focusing on the letter of the law and deciding to promote or oppose it, he focused on the intent. The intent of the Jewish law, the intent of the Jewish traditions, the intent of what was underneath why they were doing what they were doing. And he offered a new way of living into relationship with God. A new way of living out one's faith. And we hear about this way, this third way, in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew. It's the section directly following the Beatitudes that we we read last week, the second half of chapter 5. This is what Jesus said. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. 
For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches, and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool you will be liable to the hell of fire. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word yes be yes, and no be no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, for that you may be children of your God in heaven, for God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly God is perfect. That's a lot. I almost didn't want to read the whole thing, but you kind of need the whole thing. It's a lot. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Whenever I read this part of Matthew's gospel, I'm actually reminded of a well-known church phrase. I've mentioned this popular phrase before, the phrase that finds its way into church conversations whenever we're talking about change or doing something new. That phrase and mindset which has and can lead to the downfall of a church. We've never done it that way before. It's not our tradition. What do you mean? Traditions are important. As Christians, we have traditions that connect us across the Christian family. The Lord's Prayer, the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, baptism, communion, worship, hymns, the season of the church year. These are our Christian traditions. As a St. Luke's congregation, we have our own traditions. Three morning worship services. I'm told that ending our Good Friday service with a gym singing, Were You There?, is one of those traditions. <laughs> Someone whistles. Lighting candles as we do on Christmas Eve, it's a tradition. How we baptize in this congregation is a tradition. And as families, we all have our own traditions. Who sits at what place at the table? How holidays are celebrated, vacations, prayer time. I'm sure if I asked, you could begin listing family traditions from the past or the present without even having to give it much thought. 
Traditions connect us to the past as well as the present, to people as well as feelings and memories. Traditions can ground us. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, understood the importance of tradition so much so that it's one leg in our Wesleyan quadrilateral, that tool for faith development and faith expression, which includes scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Tradition is important. And when done right, opens us to something beyond ourselves. And yet traditions can also get in the way sometimes. And when traditions get in the way, it's not usually because there's something faulty about the tradition. It's usually because we've put the tradition itself above the intent and purpose of it. We have this tendency to enshrine traditions. You ever notice that? We enshrine traditions to the point that we close ourselves to what could be. Try to imagine Christmas Eve without candle lighting. <laughs> Nancy went to one this year. She can tell you all about it. <laughs> but if you're like me, who has lit a candle on Christmas Eve, I think every year of my life that I could hold a candle, the thought actually causes physical discomfort. Sometimes we don't want to let go. The story I shared about the university and the sidewalk. I really liked that story when Jim first told me that, but the more I thought about it this week as I was delving into the chapter for today, the less I liked the story. I loved the idea of allowing the students and the staff to create the paths, this open invitation to see where people naturally walked. I loved that part. But then the concrete was laid. And what had once been an open invitation now became confined and set in stone. What worked for one was now supposed to work for everyone, forever and always. It's what we do with traditions. What was meaningful at one point now sometimes is supposed to be meaningful forever. We often lose the intent and we enshrine the tradition. Once we've decided that Christmas Eve without candlelighting will not be Christmas Eve, we close ourselves to what it could be. We close ourselves to possibilities, to new relationships. And that's what this whole section of Scripture is warning us about, about the dangers of allowing tradition and law to become enshrined. You've heard that it was said, is how Jesus starts. You've heard that it was said. But I say to you, he takes each of the laws one step further, not in an effort to, more, to be more restrictive or more strict. He takes them one step further to delve deeper into the meaning and the purpose and the intent. What is this law about? How does it connect us with God? And are we fully living in to that? It isn't just about not murdering or not committing adultery. Jesus wanted people to look at what was in their heart. Look at what was in their soul. When we let ourselves be consumed by anger or hatred or lust or judgment, then it separates us from God and from others. When we say that we seek justice but instead turn to violence and vengeance, we become a part of that cycle of injustice. When we find ourselves justifying poor behavior by citing somebody else's actions, or we hold back love and respect because we've deemed somebody unworthy, then we've missed the intent of the tradition of the law. We've missed the relationship with God. We've missed the relationship with each other. As Brian McLaren put it in his book, the intent of tradition isn't merely to be in the right. The goal is to be in right relationship. So in the phrases, but I say to you, Jesus offered a third way. He argued that the traditions and the laws weren't supposed to lead either to conformity or to rebellion, but instead were a road, a path guiding us to faithful living. But we live in a literal-minded culture. We live in a society where the letter of the law can sometimes become the law of the land, and many base their behavior on what is legal or illegal, even when legal isn't just. 
Jesus argued this misses the whole point of the law. It misses the whole point of the tradition, which is why the section ended with a verse that Christians have been struggling with for centuries and generations. Be perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly God is perfect. It's one of those verses that I would love to ignore sometimes. I don't know if about you, but I have a list of verses that sometimes I wish weren't in the Bible. This is one of them. Be perfect. That word perfect, I think we get tripped up on. God is perfect, and we're supposed to somehow be perfect like God. But there's a translation I prefer. And I will say I prefer it because I think it actually gets to what Jesus is talking about more than the be perfect. Maybe I just prefer it. But it's be compassionate. Therefore, as your heavenly God is compassionate. God's love and compassion and grace is perfect. It's offered to everyone. It's unconditional. It's given freely by God. And Jesus is asking us to do that same. Be perfect in compassion as God is. Give love and grace and compassion freely as God does. Put people above policy. Put relationship above law. Let go of our desire to be right and instead choose empathy for those whose experiences is different from our own. It's a different way of being that Jesus is offering. We see some of the context that he speaks to playing out today in our own world, in religion and in politics, at global, national, local levels, all around, where we've put our focus on the letter of the law rather than on relationship. Sometimes we put our focus on what we call traditional understandings, and rather than this opening the conversation, it closes it. We use the law and the tradition as a weapon or a shield rather than as an invitation into faithful living, an invitation into deeper conversation. We use tradition and law to disconnect rather than connect, to create winners and losers. And then we watch as youth are losing their lives in the midst of it all, as people of all ages are losing their lives in the midst of it all. Somehow disconnection has become the way. And unfortunately, our context hasn't changed all that much from Jesus' time, as this is part of what he was addressing in the Sermon on the Mount. He said to be a disciple is to live differently than how we're living. To be a disciple is to follow his way and make a new path, one in which relationship with God is primary, and that relationship with God leads us into relationship with others and into relationship with ourselves. Towards the end of the chapter, Brian McLaren says, again, using example after example, Jesus directs his disciples beyond what the tradition requires to what the Creator desires. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly God is perfect, he says. Some people might assume that by be perfect, Jesus meant achieve external technical perfection, which is what the scribes and the Pharisees aimed for. But Jesus means something far deeper, far wiser. He tells them that God doesn't let rain and sunshine fall only on the good people's lands, leaving bad people to starve. No, God is good to all. No exceptions. God's perfection is a compassionate and gracious perfection. It goes far beyond the traditional requirements of the scribes and Pharisees. You have heard that it was said... But I say to you, Jesus encouraged his disciples and encourages us to delve deeper into our hearts and into our minds and discover there a new path. And it's a path of discipleship. It's a path that seeks to connect with the heart of God, that seeks to live out the teachings of Jesus. It isn't about being right or wrong. It's about being in right relationship with ourselves, with God, and with each other. And when we do this, then we allow the law and the tradition to inform us and open us into something new. So as you journey through Lent, as you make this road by walking, can you let tradition guide you and at the same time guide tradition into something new and exciting and life-giving 
Can we find that perfect compassion and grace that I believe exists within all of us? And can we let that guide our way? Amen.